Well, good afternoon. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. I guess some of you are probably wondering what the director of the National Park Service is doing in front of a group of health professionals. Um, well, first, it might surprise you that the National Park Service actually has an Office of Public Health staffed by the U.S. Public Health Service officers, and which is today led by Captain Chuck Higgins. Chuck, you're out there someplace. If you would stick up your hand to show the crowd that we actually do have public health officers in the, or the organization. Second, it would be helpful to step back in time just a little bit, that for 150 years, the role that parks have played has largely been unrecognized and that there is a connection between our public lands and public health. Frederick Law Olmsted, really the father of landscape architecture, was also the creative genius behind Central Park in New York. But he was also a conservationist when very few people were really thinking about conservation. When he designed Central Park, Olmsted was not just imagining an idyllic place where the Victorian families could stroll about on Sundays. This was New York in the 1850s. Olmsted was living in a city that had the realities of the Industrial Revolution. Workers worked and lived in crowded, disease-plagued tenement houses, but they called it home. Epidemiology and modern gene thir uh, germ theory were virtually unknown. What people believed in those days was miasma, the idea that sickness was caused by bad vapors, and there were certainly lots of bad vapors in the cities at the time. Regardless, Olmsted's response was remarkable in many ways in its wisdom. He saw public parks as a remedy. He envisioned large open spaces where nature prevailed and city dwellers could escape the toxic effects of the 19th century urban life, a refuge where they could rejuvenate themselves and breathe clean air. Places like New York Central Park and the chain of green spaces that he created around Boston and Buffalo would serve as what he called the lungs of the city. And they continue to this day to be incredible assets to those cities. But unfortunately, we've spent the last few generations divorcing ourselves from the natural world. And we're seeing the consequences today. It's not just disappearing open space, but the effects of technology and our attitudes towards the outdoors. Our entertainments are instant, labor-free, and ever-present. Arthur Richard Louvre, in his book, The Last Child in the Woods, uses the term nature deficit disorder to describe the disturbing trend which has, one of, has consequences of tripling the obesity rates in children since the 1970s. Unlike the impoverished tenement dwellers of the Olmsted time, today we suffer the effects of, of, of prosperity. I don't think there's a term that characterizes the current obesity crisis any better than drive-through. Our communities are built to accommodate the automobile with everything designed for convenience and the elimination of effort. It's even sometimes totally impossible to walk to where you want to go. So it's no wonder that in addition to obesity, we are confronted with a rise in diabetes, heart disease, emphysema, and cancer. And it's why the Centers for Disease Control have been studying urban sprawl and its effects on public health. The national parks and the green spaces in general are an important but often overlooked variable in the American public health equation. Earlier generations, which had a closer connection to this country's natural character, seemed to have an innate grasp of go outside and play, as our mothers told us uh, when they were dealing with rambunctious kids. As the stewards of 395 of America's most treasured natural and cultural landmarks, and the host to 280 million visitors a year. The National Park Service knows a great deal about the outdoors, how people interact with it, and the effects of this interaction. There were certain convictions in the founding of the National Park Service in 1916. One of them was that certainly was preservation, but there was also the belief that the American people needed to maintain their connection to their natural legacy, that the outdoors were critical, 
not only to their physical well-being, but to their psychological health as well. Numerous studies indicate the benefits of getting outside and getting active. Unlike supervised sports or exercise in gyms, the outdoors encourage spontaneous, unstructured activity, which often translates into more prolonged exercise. This is especially true for young people, and research also shows that they continue this activity well into adulthood. Natural light is known for its therapeutic effects, and research suggests that being outdoors can have positive effects on everything from stress to attention, dis attention deficit disorders to rates of healing, and recently there was a report even on nearsightedness. Simply taking an hour-long walk in a natural environment can bring about a drop in blood pressure and heart rate because of the immediate relaxation you experience. There can be an increase in white blood cell count, a reduction in stress hormones, and a boost to the immune system. And guess what? It doesn't cost anything. It's free. Translated into the modern healthcare system, imagine an American city with a high rate of type 2 diabetes. A public health intervention might include not only an education campaign, but the city's parks and open spaces. Access to the outdoors and its positive effects on health could be a part of a highly cost-effective prevention strategy. Many of you are probably aware of the CDC's list of the 10 greatest achievements in public health over the past century. They include vaccination, fluoridation of drinking water, and the control of infectious diseases. I believe that reconnecting to nature, providing access to open space, being physically active in the natural environment should be added to that list. We are now engaged in a wide-ranging effort to bring the outdoors into the discussion about public health and to bring lasting change to Americans' lifestyle choices, their nutrition, and their relationship with nature. This is part of President Obama's much broader America's Great Outdoors initiative, a multi-agency effort aimed to, at helping to conserve open space and reconnecting Americans to nature. Key to this is his request to fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. For those of you who don't know, the LWCF is not a tax, it's a revenue. It's the revenue generated from Outer Continental Shelf oil drilling. And it has been around for 65 years, but only once in its history has it been fully funded at $900 million. This is the fund that creates parks for all people. And we are attempting to refund, to refill that program, and specifically target LWCF to create parks in underserved communities, particularly in urban environments. <laughs> America's Great Outdoors has resulted in a national conversation on what needs to be done to protect our natural resources and to ensure that the outdoors continues to be a part of our lives. Over the last two years, listening sessions across the country explored ways to counter the trend of vanishing open space and separation from the outdoors. We have learned that American cities do not have enough parks for children and that open green space for the urban disadvantaged is scarce. Just like there are food deserts, there are park deserts. We are tapping the expertise of leaders in academia, private industry, and conservation so that we can introduce, reintroduce Americans to the outdoors and provide for this basic human right. First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move program, which is dedicated to fighting childhood obesity, is by encouraging exercise and good nutrition, is also a major initiative. But we've started a corollary, Let's Move Outside. And that is administered by the Department of Interior and led by the National Park Service, and serves as a way to connect Americans to the rivers, parks, trails, and forests in their community. Now, also, to put our money where our mouth is, the National Park Service has started a pilot program in parks across the country with our concessioners to provide nutritious, healthy, and locally grown food. This not only encourages healthy eating habits, but has the added benefit of sustaining the local agricultural economy. All of this is a, taking place as a sweeping change 
as we look at our health and the outdoors. Beyond the national parks, the National Park Service has been helping to create local recreational opportunities for decades. Our Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program has been in existence for 45 years and has a long record of success helping communities develop trails and riverfronts so that residents have an opportunity to get outside and get physical exercise. A few examples. In Arkansas, we partnered with the city of Little Rock and physicians from the state's largest cardiology clinic to establish a trail system known as the Medical Mile. Incorporated as part of the larger Arkansas River Trail, the Medical Mile goes through downtown Little Rock and along the waterfront, offering exhibits and other educational media focusing on health and exercise. It not only revitalizes the area, but serves as a catalyst for the type of lifestyle change that is so important to preventing conditions like obesity and heart disease. In New York, New York City, we've spent over a decade reconnecting people to the Bronx River. And this past Friday, the Secretary of Interior and I launched a similar initiative to reconnect communities to the Harlem River. One of our more innovative programs we're doing is called Park Prescriptions. Parks provide promotional materials directly to local health providers so that sh they can show patients where to go and to get outside and to exercise. Doctors can actually prescribe a visit to a park and patients can see what kind of trails are available and if a particular park <laughs> and if a particular park offers guided hikes. We call this take a hike and call me in the morning. Three national parks, Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, the Indiana Dunes, and Golden Gate currently are participating in this program. While this initiative is in its early stages, we are hopeful that it will expand not only throughout the national park system, but into state and local parks across the country. At Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, one of the great classic western parks, we have built 20 miles of paved pathways that connect the park to the local communities of Jackson. That the National Park Service has done this in partnership with the U.S. Department of Transportation is a good example of working together to achieve a nationally significant objective. There is also a growing body of evidence that suggests that human health is directly linked to the health of our natural world. So if we neglect the natural world, we do that at our own peril. As we promote healthy activity outdoors, we are also sending the message that the outdoors itself needs to be cared for. The awareness of this is increasingly global, as evidenced by the international movement known as Healthy Parks, Healthy People. There's a mutual benefit of getting people outdoors and introducing them to nature. First, they are exposed to an essential healthy experience that is part of being what it means to be human. Second, it is a teachable moment an opportunity to learn how critical it is to maintain a healthy environment that is so important to life on this planet. Just as a doctor does with a patient, we have a way of monitoring the health of the lands and the ecosystems in our care, of checking the nature's vital signs. And it is through these signs that we learn, for example, how plants and animals react to climate change and the effects of invasive species. There is a strong correlation between a healthy natural environment and the human health, because one really cannot exist without the other. This past April, the National Park Service hosted the first Healthy Parks, Healthy People Conference in the United States, where a broad array of participants discussed ways of addressing this nation's human and environmental health challenges. This meeting brought together healthcare specialists, scientists, scholars, community leaders, and nonprofits, all of whom have a stake in maintaining public health. We began a discussion around several points, and I want to lay these out for you today. How can parks work with innovators in business, with the healthcare industry, and other influential forces to promote wellness and drive down healthcare costs? How can we bring a cultural change in which parks are valued not just as scenery, but as the untapped sources of healthy living that they truly are. How can we bring this message to community leaders and other decision makers 
and get their buy-in and their support in making this a sustainable idea. How can we discuss human health as it relates to the health of the planet, a subject that brings a whole range of other issues into the conversation, such as climate change, pollution, development, and alternative energy? The National Park Service is seeking new partnerships in the professional health community, for partnerships that will work to strengthen the connection between public lands and public health. We are trying to encourage a broader vision of a healthier nation in which parks and open spaces play a vital role. This is a big part of our five-year plan, which we have launched to prepare for our second century of stewardship when the National Park Service turns 100 in 2016. Whatever your role in public health, I encourage you to consider the important role of the outdoors and nature that can play in this nation's health care system. Health care costs are center stage in our national debate over the economy and our country's future. When you consider the power of the outdoors and its universal, free availability, you simply cannot come up with a health care investment that will yield a better return. Think of national, state, regional, county, and city parks as your asset at your disposal. Reach for them as you might reach for a vaccine. We want to hear your ideas on practical measures that will help build a new system in which parks and human health are firmly connected. We encourage you to form partnerships across local, state, and federal levels and find ways to integrate the outdoors into public health missions. It is simply too good of an opportunity, too powerful a remedy to ignore. I encourage more research and a vigorous advocacy concerning the health effects of being active in the natural world and that there are parks available for all people in every community in the country. In fact, I invite you to use the national parks as laboratories in this all-important research. It's curious that people use the expression get back to nature, as if something has been lost and needs to be found. Observing daily life in the New York City of his time, Frederick Law Olmsted understood this, and he was not alone. By the end of the 19th century, changing cultural attitudes towards nature sparked an entire movement. People built rustic vacation cottages, went off to wilderness resorts, and generally embarked on a rediscovery of natural America. Even art and architecture reflected the change. Perhaps we are on the verge of a similar movement today. I hope we are, because the stakes are higher now than they were in Victorian America. Given the unprecedented environmental challenges we are facing, the future will demand not only a new way of looking at the natural world and our place in it, but an understanding of how the physical well-being is tied to that of the environment. Parks are going to be a critical factor in this equation. We share a common vital concern. Our missions are, in fact, quite similar. Speaking for the National Park Service, that is the keeper of the American narrative, from the 70 sites related to the Civil War and its legacy of slavery, to the civil rights sites of Selma to Montgomery and our 395th National Park, the memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., to the greatest iconic parks of the West, we have a great deal to contribute to public health and to the rights of every American to have a safe place to play outdoors. It's a role we are eager to fulfill, one that we are looking forward to, and I hope that the future finds us working together. Thank you.